Scripture, because the um, the incident of our Lord meeting the demoniac appears in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. And so what happens is, in the wisdom of the church, they include all three gospel lessons every year. And so you have to give a homily on Jesus casting out the demoniacs into the herd of swine three times a year. And after... Uh, 20 years, it starts to become a problem to find something to say that you have not already said 10 or 12 times. Um, the encounter in Matthew is kind of a thread thin because you don't get some of the details that you do in uh, Mark and in Luke. And some of the details of Mark and Luke are very important. Uh, one of the things is Jesus asked the name of the demon and the demon says, we're not one, we're a legion. And so uh, the reason that this uh, one particular demoniac was so fierce, broke his chains, lived in the tombs, scared everybody so nobody could take the road by this particular cemetery, uh, was that uh, he was filled with a legion of, of, of uh, demons, and uh, that gave him an enormous strength in a demonic way. Uh, that he could tear chains and that he could harm people. <clears throat> the, um, the, the other thing that you don't get very clearly in Matthew's passage is that um, the demon essentially says to Jesus, uh, hey, it's before our time, and why are you messing with us? Because uh, the time that you can really cast us into the abyss is on the final judgment day of the second coming. And so you encountering us today, you're stepping out of the rules of time, the rules of the Father, uh, and messing with us now. Now, one of the problems we have is that in our day, um, we have um, banished the idea of Satan and demons. And so that's kind of like Halloween. You know, where there are ghosts and stuff like that, that this modern materialistic scientific age we don't believe in anymore. 
Now what it does is it robs us of the ability to deal with evil possession. And um, we have decided that that's all about psychiatry and mental illness. And so when somebody is really possessed by demons, violently possessed, we end up putting them on very heavy drugs because we can't cure them. Uh, and they end up slogging around, you know, uh, in, in an almost living coma, alive, but really not alive. Because we, 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 don't, we, we don't have the ability to discriminate between what is demon possession and what is, in fact, just mental illness. And uh, there is, of course, always a evil dimension to mental illness. There's no question about that. And what we do now is we treat the symptoms of mental illness, but not the cause. So if somebody is deeply depressed, we put them on an antidepressant, and it gets rid of the pain of depression. But the problem that the alarm of depression is going off and telling us is there. Like physical pains, alarm telling a doctor there's something wrong in the body. Uh, and so we end up not dealing with the problem, but only turning off the alarm. And the same thing is true of anxiety and schizophrenia and a number of other illnesses. And it's sad because we uh, have walked away from God and God's cure and restoration to wholeness of people. And we now have a uh, mental illness concept that treats only the painful symptoms and not the cause. And so people remain caught in the throes of their illness, but dope down so the alarm doesn't go off. And it's a great sadness that that occurs because God intends us to be healed. But we've sort of, we've sort of um, banished God to the sidelines. Uh, and we don't believe in Satan and demons. We've abandoned, we push God to the sidelines. And so we don't deal with the reality of the evil in this life that we encounter and that at times possesses us. The really final sad thing about this particular uh, incident with Jesus, he cures the guy, and when the and, and, and the passage Matthew doesn't show it, but Mark and Luke do, when the people in town come out, uh, this demon who was nude, naked, because he couldn't keep they couldn't keep clothes on him, uh, he's sitting there, wholly restored to sanity talking like a sane man with Jesus and the disciples. And uh, the example of the power of God and the intent of God, the love and grace of God restoring us to holiness is sitting right there before them. And what do they do? Get out of town. Because you killed our pigs. And we don't like the fact that we lost the pigs because we lost money. And we're not willing to trade that off the sanity and wholeness of this man that was a threat to all of us whenever we walked down this road. So Jesus gets out of town. The uh, healed demoniac uh, in the other uh, in the other accounts wants to go with Jesus, and Jesus tells him no to stay here and to tell of the working glory of God here to these people. And it is the belief of the church, of course, that he did, and he laid the ground for the conversion of people in that in that area that was a kind of semi-secular area uh, in Palestine. And so, but, but the question that raises for us, when do we tell Jesus to go away? When is the power of Jesus healing and sanctifying and making us holy inconvenient? Because it gets in the way of our schedule it gets in the way of things that we think are important to us. And we really had our minds on right, recognizing that this uh, lifetime on earth is a very brief period in the eternity we're going to live in. And we better get to work sanctifying ourselves with the help of the grace of God so that we can live in eternity in the presence of God. But it's inconvenient to spend all that time dealing with our passions and our sins and getting right with God. And so we would rather banish God to limited times like Sunday at the liturgy and not every day in our life with a prayer room and with really deal, standing in the presence of God with everything we do. And so the gospel lesson today provokes the question, when do we tell Jesus, go away, get out of town, leave us alone?
the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now and ever into ages of 